Good morning. I'm Mike Barnes. I'm the managing attorney with DCBA Law and Policy in Washington, D.C. And I'd like to thank you for being here early and um, looking forward to getting started with some important themes for the Access Summit. Before uh, we begin, I want to uh, start with uh, my disclosure, which is that I, I do work with healthcare companies, um, including some of the not for profit advocacy organizations that are disclosed here, but uh, want to make certain that you know that I'm speaking on my own behalf today, not on behalf of any client's interests, and that um, additionally, the uh, Topics that I'm discussing and the perspectives that I'm discussing are uh, also based on uh, the experience that I have, especially over the past year or so. I'd like to thank uh, David Barthwell with uh, Verge Studios because uh, I've made an effort to uh, keep this presentation as up-to-date as possible. In fact, as up-to-date as 3 a.m. Uh, in the morning. And David with Verge Studios is very, really helpful in making sure that the presentation uh, is graphically uh, appealing in light of the fact that uh, I otherwise uh, would have just given you uh, plain bullets and black and white. Uh, I've wor worked with Dave for about 10 years and uh, really appreciate uh, your flexibility, Dave. He's one of our table captains. I'd also like to thank uh, C4 Recovery Solutions and uh, Dee McGraw and Kitty, my vet, for their uh, leadership and for the invitation to join you today, as well as the program sponsors and exhibitors. So as I mentioned, I've updated this session, and in fact, it's going to be slightly different from what you see in the program for the conference. I'm going to have less analysis on the law and case law, and actually uh, move instead to a discussion of industry trends, ethics, and leadership. I see this as more pressing based on uh, my recent practice as well as engagement recently with insurers and discussions with some of the access participants. Again, as recently as last night, including a discussion of uh, uh, part of, of some of the comments from last night's uh, presentation. Uh, to the extent that you're interested in the analysis um, of the laws, especially the healthcare fraud and abuse laws, I have a journal article that really sets forth not just the legal basis, but also the factual basis as they apply to urine drug testing. And as I'll discuss today, there are a great deal of parallels between what has been happening in the urine drug testing market and what is also occurring uh, in the addiction treatment field. And so uh, to the extent that your programs are not all necessarily um, coordinated with urine drug testing laboratories, thank you, Dr. Barthwell. Um, the uh, lessons that we're learning from the laboratory industry, I think, are going to be quite instructive as uh, we're trying to deal with some of the challenges facing the addiction treatment field. So uh, I'm hoping that the slides will be posted uh, and you'll be able to uh, get to see the citation for the journal article that I referenced on the healthcare fraud and abuse laws. Um, but it's an article from the Journal of Opioid Management, and uh, it's from 2015, just recently published. That'll be in the slides, which I've sent to C4 staff and should be available online in the very near term. So uh, I also will be around through Wednesday in the event that you're interested in getting uh, my input uh, on the journal article uh, and the citation from me as well. So just a preview of uh, some of the uh, themes for today. Uh, your field, by my perspective, is uh, in the midst of a, a great deal of opportunity and activity, and that's proving to be good for a lot of businesses, including many of you with whom I've spoken already. Uh, but there is a lack of clarity. There is a lack of clarity as to the standard of care when it comes to the people who are uh, being asked to pay for the services that you're providing in the addiction treatment field, uh, and to some extent they're imposing their own. And so there's also coverage and reimbursement um, issues where you're not sure what their policies are and how they're going to provide coverage with respect to addiction treatment. And in some, in some events, as is uh, too often when dealing with insurers, there's a, a sort of a bait and switch feeling. Uh, and uh, that uh, is a major impact to small businesses that are just trying to do their best to provide services to people who desperately need them. There's some lack of clarity in the law. Uh, and we know that uh, healthcare practitioners generally are regulated very closely by state law, and we know that the addiction treatment programs are also 
but there's a discrepancy as between some of the uh, laws as related to referrals, for example, kickbacks, uh, and generally ethics that, uh, at least for my clients, are causing some questions that we need to resolve. And I think it's actually more uh, industry-wide that you're going to need to try to develop greater clarity as it relates not just to the law, but the ethics in areas where there's not currently law, but you might not necessarily want for there to be. We'll talk about the profiteering and the threats that it poses not just to consumers, but also to your industry as a whole. And then the government and payer responses to that profiteering Again, drawing lessons from what we've seen over the past uh, three to five years in the urine drug testing market. So they'll provide some recommendations for programs and then also discuss the need for greater industry, industry leadership. We'll talk about some of the progress over the past year uh, and that also relates to the industry leadership. And then I want to drop a bomb at the end, uh, talking about 26 politics and elections. So as a matter of big picture context, you're aware because you live uh, on a daily basis the fact that we are in the midst of a public health crisis and now other people are finally realizing that. We're hearing it about it on Capitol Hill more than ever. It's uh, understandable given that we've got 129 people dying per day. When I updated my slide last night about this particular statistic, I found that 129 statistic actually from U.S. Senator Rob Portman. He gave uh, a Republican address on the radio yesterday, and the theme was the Comprehensive Addiction Recovery Act. That's federal legislation that is dealing with pretty much an array of your wish list, and it's likely to pass. So we now have action, and uh, we need to make sure that the action is complementary to what's been going on. We know that up to this point, there's been a heavy focus on opioid supply reduction and they've been focusing exclusively on, on opioids for pain at the state level and federal level um, in many regards. But you all are aware that it's also necessary to address benzodiazepines and stimulants and sedatives in addition to the illicit substances as you're trying to create systems that actually uh, allow people uh, to um, live healthy lives to avoid uh, getting caught up in uh, substance use and um, contracting the disorder. Um, and part of that is, of course, as we discussed a bit last night, the need for information and literature and to know what's going on and what works, what the problem is, and how to fix it. There's a recent report that just came out from the National Institute on Drug Abuse with researchers also from the Food and Drug Administration and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And it addresses what we've seen as the surge in use and deaths of heroin. And it's something that I think that um, we need to be aware of as we talk about the policy matters, some of which were touched on last night. And um, as we look to the difficult uh, issue of pain, we of course are aware in addiction treatment medicine practitioners and pain practitioners are coming to recognize that you really cannot address one without addressing the other. We heard that last night. Um, for example, when you're treating people for addiction, you ultimately find in many cases that there is underlying pain, uh, not just of an emotional type, but also probably of a physical type as well. And you can't treat addiction, you can't treat pain without recognizing the risk of addiction, right? That when you are using controlled prescription medications of any type, there's a greater risk. Abuse is largely one of those risks, and you have to address that. So, as we think about the individuals who have these disorders, which are typically or oftentimes co-occurring, you have to display compassion for people on both sides of the issue, however they approach their problems or their suffering. And that really has not been happening. But what this NIDA report does is it helps you to understand that the people who need prescription medications are not necessarily, as the news would suggest, or even many advocates, who are opposed to um, the use of uh, certain medications would suggest. It's not that if you take these medications, you're uh, more inclined actually to shift over to heroin. There are numbers that say that people who are taking heroin also have abused prescription medications, but it's not the other way around, where if you take these particular medications that you're necessarily going to shift to heroin. I think that's really important as we approach policy and again, display compassion for people, however they approach their problems and suffering. So a big focus now in public policy, and as you'll see when you look up the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, there's finally a focus on what has been lacking, especially in the opioid abuse epidemic, 
which is interventions and referral to treatment, the corresponding demand reduction. We now have law enforcement providing leadership on the topic of interventions and referrals to treatment as opposed to punishment for someone's disease state. There has been a national discussion of criminal justice reform and voting rights restoration. That has slowed, but President Obama still has expressed that this is a priority of his for the remainder of his term. It'll be interesting to see how the politics of the election cycle might uh, derail his agenda, and I would think that uh, by the way it's looking now, we might not get as much progress on this as we would like, uh, but at least with the engagement of law enforcement and the reconsideration of how they approach people with substance use, there's opportunity to uh, engage, and one of my clients, for example, is working to provide treatment in a jail system, and it works out so that you're not just uh, helping people when they're there, but also when they're uh, coming out. And ultimately, we know that these therapeutic approaches reduce the costs and the recidivism associated uh, with the offenses that get people into the criminal justice system in the first place. Federal legislation like CARA, uh, which I'll refer to uh, even more often today, uh, also deals with interventions and referral to treatment. I'm not going to discuss the uh, provisions of that um, proposed bill, but I will go into uh, uh, some of what it intended, is intended to do. You can look it up. It's uh, pretty prominent on the internet. Uh, and again, I'll also discuss uh, I, what I believe to be the likelihood of its passage. Throughout the presentation, I've got some true and false questions for you. And uh, we've got a system that should allow you to be able to log on through your um, mobile device to provide an answer. And so the first question that I have is true or false, individuals with substance use disorders have benefited from the Affordable Care Act. Okay, so was that a 100% response? Uh, and out of all two uh, repliers? <laughs> Maybe a show of hands would help. Uh, 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 do you believe that individuals with SUGs have benefited from the Affordable Care Act? True. Okay, yes, the tr uh, there are some truths. Uh, is there a number of people who believe that it's false, that people have not uh, benefited from the Affordable Care Act? Okay, I can relate to that as one who's lost his insurance three times since 2009. Uh, but we're going to talk about the Affordable Care Act a, a great deal uh, because uh, there's so much going on now related to, uh, all right, so we're at 88 and 13. There's so much going on related to um, the implementation of the Affordable Care Act in your daily practice. Uh, and then also then the, the, the greater political questions as to what's going to happen to the Affordable Care Act, that we have to give thought to it. Um, and I can say, though, that it's apparent that more consumers are accessing treatment under the Affordable Care Act, especially as you consider that the provisions of the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, what I'll refer to as the Equity Act, have been extended to many of the Affordable Care Act programs. And so treatment providers are getting paid more often through uh, insurance programs. And by my anecdotal experience, even just over the past day, uh, and by the looks of some of the companies that have been here in past years, it looks like programs are expanding. And we see that there are mergers and acquisitions. That's oftentimes in the industry news. And there's a successful company here that's able to uh, uh, support the conference and exhibit. Um, so I do think that we're in the midst of a time for this field where we've got some really important transformation that has occurred and continues to occur as a result of federal legislation and regulation. And the next thing to come will likely be CARA, um, and that is a pro, a federal legislation that would provide grants for prevention, for uh, public awareness. It would include a number of grants to states, uh, and it's um, likely to be supported by Republicans because it doesn't have additional dollars to it, the, the money. Uh, is supported uh, or is provided by pulling from other discretionary funds in the budget, non-defense uh, non uh, funds. Um, and more importantly, leadership has said it intends to act on legislation related to 
opioid abuse, heroin use this year, and they want to do it soon, and they want to get it out of the way. And this is especially important because we're dealing with a uh, balance of power in the U.S. Senate, where we don't know what's going to happen in the U.S. Senate come uh, November with the new Congress convening in January. But we know that three of the main co-sponsors of this uh, legislation on the Senate side are in really, really tight races. Portman from Ohio, the one who gave the radio address yesterday about this uh, proposed bill. Ayotte from, I believe, uh, was it Connecticut, New Hampshire? New Hampshire. New Hampshire being the state where uh, 20, 25% of, of, or more of the electorate is saying that uh, the heroin problem is their top priority. Not just their top health care priority, but their top priority. Uh, so we've had a lot of discussion from the presidential candidates in New Hampshire about uh, the uh, epidemic of uh, opioid and heroin use. And then uh, Kirk from Illinois also. So with those tight races, they need to go back home and say, we're dealing with what is affecting our families and our communities. And leadership wants to be able to say that you know, we've responded to the needs of our constituents. So that they've got uh, strong races in these uh, uh, you know, toss-up states. Um, so uh, the, the politics are looking such that it is likely that this legislation will pass. Um, that combined with the fact that we know that the federal government will be issuing new regulations around the treatment of opioid use disorders with buprenorphine, uh, there again is going to be a greater opportunity for individuals to access treatment for substance use disorders, in this case opioid use disorders, from the people, hopefully, who are qualified and who are experts. There's been some question at the federal level as to whether or not the government's efforts to deal with this buprenorphine 100 patient limit would actually take the approach of what we hear so commonly from the government and uh, in the news is not enough prescribers of buprenorphine. There are not enough doctors who are prescribing this medication to people with opioid use disorders. But we actually know that you know, in addition to trying to increase the number of prescribers, there's also the idea uh, that is heavily pushed by uh, the addiction medicine field uh, that the experts should be the ones prescribing, not the amateurs. And instead of just trying to increase more people with the eight hours of training, uh, at the minimum that we heard about last night, that you want to increase the prescribing of the individuals who have the, the best practices in place and the experience to do it the right way. Well, we know that at least by the title of the regulation that has come out from HHS uh, and it has not been publicly uh, disclosed or released yet, but it has been sent to the Office of Management and Budget for review. That uh, title includes the language, increase the number of patients. So by its direct language, we can feel pretty confident that the regulation is actually going to allow the experts to prescribe more and not just require that there be or, or facilitate that there be more amateurs uh, providing the treatment. So those of you who have practices that include buprenorphine assisted treatment uh, or work with them um, should be seeing that there will be changes by the end of the Obama administration. Uh, because we know that with the likelihood that there a possibility that there would be a Republican president and pretty much all of them have said we're going to put a stop uh, to regulation out of the Obama administration on day one. Um, the administration is aware of, aware of that. They're aware of the political risk. They're going to have this done by the time Obama leaves office in January. We're anticipating that this regulation could be final as of around November of this year. Another true or false, health insurers are adequately fair and transparent in implementing their coverage and reimbursement policies. I know we do have some insurers in the audience, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but we're assuming that you're the good guys and you are the industry leaders in your field. And to the extent there are um, you know, only a few of you, I can't imagine how the uh, percentages are going to look on this one. <laughs> so where are the insurers? Okay, there we go. <laughs> 
All right. I'm impressed. Uh, and, and I'm hoping that somebody will note these for me. I forgot to bring up a pen and paper, but uh, this is fascinating. I want to take a couple notes. So maybe, Dr. Barthwell, if you could make a note of what we've seen in these poll results, I'd appreciate that. <clears throat> To say the least, there's a lack of clarity in uh, the field of addiction treatment as it relates to insurers understanding your practice and the services that you provide and the value that the best programs out there are providing. And so additionally to that, naturally, insurers have reimbursement policies that are unclear and oftentimes ad hoc. I, um, and having had to select yet again another insurance program through the exchange in uh, DC where my small business operates, uh, had a formulary as of December 2015 on the 15th of that month when I chose my plan, by the time that I tried to get my medication in early January, that formulator, that formulary was totally different. And what I had calculated my expected costs on, and as, as it's supposed to be the case under the Affordable Care Act where consumers actually have a, a say in how they consume health care and therefore you control costs by that consumer having the chunk of the uh, cost to bear. Uh, how can they do that when there's not transparency and they can just bait and switch consumers? That's happening now, uh, not just to people like me, not just with formularies, it's happening as we hear from treatment programs when they have prior approvals that are withdrawn after the patients in the programs have relied on them. Uh, the program standards that will be necessary for an insurer to provide reimbursement are suddenly announced after the services have been approved and then provided. They say, oh, well, you need to have a nurse on staff. Well, um, that wasn't the case when you provided approval. Refusal to assign benefits and uh, sending the payment to the provider. And so instead of sending the payment to the provider where they can um, directly access the uh, fees for their services, they send payment to the individual who is in very fragile recovery, very new recovery, if you can even call it that, to the extent that they're barely out of the active treatment phase. Well, what does that sort of chunk of cash do for someone who ultimately is at great risk of overdosing, because as we you know, know with the case of Corey Monteith and uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman and patients who I'm sure you're aware of. When you've been in treatment and then you have some sort of event that sends you back to your use, you go back to your normal amounts and overdose and death. Right? That can happen and I know of at least a couple of anecdotal cases where it has happened where big chunks of money are sent to people from insurance companies for their payment for services, all because they refuse to send payment to the provider because they're not in network. It's a way of controlling and uh, manipulating those relationships. Uh, that is certainly not just an unfair business practice, but it actually is a harm to public health and safety. Documentation of patients' payments is being required before the payment of lab claims. And so what that means is that the responsibility to pay in full has to be documented that the program has to send that in, or the laboratory uh, program equivalent would send that in as proof of payment in advance of being able to get payment for services. So I know a lot of uh, treatment programs rely on promissory notes um, to the extent that people need time to get their lives back and pay for treatment. I don't know what the um, rules would be as it relates to insurers accepting that. I, I think, again, given the ad hoc nature of their approach to reimbursement, they would say that's not acceptable. But this is all an unclear area of law that I think is now actively being litigated. We have a couple of other attorneys here who will be table captains, so uh, hopefully you'll have a chance to engage with them and get their perspectives on things like this. But again, I do believe that what we're seeing now given the recent year expenses in the laboratory industry and with the implementation of the Affordable Care Act and the growing expenses that the insurers are feeling from the addiction treatment industry, we can anticipate that what we're seeing in the lab industry is going to be applied nearly equally, if not already, in the addiction treatment industry. So we need to be very prepared and we need to uh, consolidate to make sure that we have a strong response to these sorts of things. 
So um, those sorts of uh, uh, tactics on the part of the insurers are generally the, the denials, just you know, outright, uh, we're not going to provide payment either by policy or by interpretation in an individual person's case. The audits going back and saying, we need to see the medical documentation. You need to provide us uh, the, you know, the clear uh, documentation of medical need and justification. And, and you know, in the case of certain interve interventions, how you responded to the, inver inter the information that came through something like laboratory testing. And then we also see aggressive litigation to recoup the payments that were made to laboratories. Uh, so uh, knowing that Cigna pulled out of the Florida market, citing the high costs of addiction treatment, including laboratory testing. Uh, we uh, certainly know that they're taking aggressive stances, um, you know, taking their ball and going home in this case, instead of trying to work collaboratively, as, as was suggested last night. Great suggestion, and it will be one of my suggestions as well, but I don't know how practical it is. So that'll be one of the things that I talk about as recommendations as we look to the states for legislative fixes to these sorts of things to make the Affordable Care Act work. True or false? Addiction treatment is health care. Addiction treatment is health care. This is a little bit of a trick question, actually, um, because as we look to the definition of health care under state laws, at least, there's a certain number of standards that are currently do not apply to addiction treatment programs or professionals. And so to the extent that you all believe that addiction treatment is health care, does that mean that you all also accept that the responsibilities of health care providers that are driven by the law in the states, as well as the ethics that are mandated on those particular professionals, also apply to you? So in a state like California that has anti-kickback laws that apply to licensed healthcare professionals, do those laws also apply to licensed healthcare or addiction treatment programs? Probably not from a legal perspective, which means that you can get away in California if you're not a licensed health professional with the referral payments and kickbacks that some states like Florida and Arizona are aggressively taking action against. So with this lack of clarity, what we see is that there is actually forum shopping on some part of the, some of the individuals who call my firm. We don't um, uh, uh, enable this sort of behavior, but they're saying, should I pick up my program and move it to another state so that I can continue to practice business as usual? And what we try to do is to get them to realize that it's possible to practice business in a way and to thrive in a way that is compliant with the law. And ultimately, as we look to how, from a policy perspective, we're going to be able to operate in a system of health care that actually has a balance between cost and utilization and enables people to get the care that they need, not just by dictate of insurance company, but by the respect for the patient-provider relationship with consumer choice and the option to have a say based on what your own expense is. If you're going to work in a system and live in a system like that, then you've got to figure out a way not to uh, increase the costs of uh, health care unnecessarily and not to create the sorts of lack of trust that might exist from a failure to disclose financial rate relationships. So uh, this is where a lot of activity is occurring in my practice, and fortunately, I'm in a strong position to work with a number of uh, ethical treatment programs or the programs that are doing their best to adopt highest ethical standards, many of which are here as exhibitors. And so some of the things that they are having to deal with is how do we approach the notion of self-referrals if we have an interest in a drug testing laboratory or management company. What do we do when we have someone who's really good at referring patients but we hear that we're not really supposed to be providing these payments on a uh, fee for a referral basis. Uh, so the volume or value of the referral cannot be considered in my particular state. What should we do? Should we move out or can we adjust the way that we structure our uh, agreements with our employees and our contractors? Again, how do I deal with the fact that um, someone who's referring to my program may be an interventionist uh, is also uh, in a financial relationship with my program. 
uh, you know, do I disclose that? How do I disclose that? Do I disclose the amount? And again, there is confusion as to whether or not that interventionist and then the treatment program are required to act in the patient's best interests or whether they choose to act in the patient's best interests as, a, as opposed to the financial interest is driven by the volume, volume or value of the referrals. This is something that has plagued the laboratory industry sometime. We see a lot of in, uh, action there, as I already noted. Uh, other things that people are uh, calling us about and asking about are what do we do about the payment of the insurance premiums and in travel to get people into our program? So is it fair to have somebody who finds people who are clearly in need of help gets them a change of life enrollment for, under the Affordable Care Act and so they can get insurance and we'll, pro, we'll pay the premium so that uh, we can then provide the services to this individual uh, and also we're going to fly this person across country at our own expense so that we can provide the services for this individual and get reimbursement through the uh, exchange plan which under the Affordable Care Act is subject to the Equity Act provisions. Big question for a lot of people, and it really just uh, just, just depend legally uh, on you know how you consider yourself bound by certain state laws, and that analysis needs to be done individually. Depends also on how you um, d decide that you're going to engage uh, from an ethical perspective as well. And then marketing, so many complaints and New York Times investigation into deceptive internet and call center practices. Promising a cure or X percent success rate without disclosing you know, how it is that you came to that sort of conclusion. <clears throat> and then the testimonials saying, I was cured, uh, yeah, I feel great, it was easy, whatever. Those sorts of things are uh, pretty much uh, for forbidden under state and federal consumer protection laws. And in uh, many of these cases, uh, it's not just a matter of ethics uh, for the individuals conducting these particular types of activities, but actually legal compliance. It's more of a matter of ethics for the industry and how you deal with someone you know is doing those sorts of things. Profiteering in your field is a problem for the people who are trying to do things right and trying to uh, provide care under a system that is feeling heavily threatened by addiction treatment. Right, so in the buprenorphine space, we have pill mills that have basically started to occupy what the uh, oxycodone pill mills from Florida and Tennessee and Kentucky uh, previously served as, uh, you know, in a, as a source for substances of abuse in those particular uh, states. The buprenorphine pill mills are not necessarily uh, the same way in terms of fostering abuse. They, I imagine in many cases of people who are going to these programs have legitimate medical needs and uh, that they might be in a financial situation where they're forced to perhaps sell or share their medications but for purposes of medical misuse where there's someone else who has a need who can't get treatment because after all we're dealing currently with a hundred patient limit and by the way we're dealing with limits on Medicaid reimbursement so that uh, if a doctor is not willing to accept just twenty three dollars per visit to do all the things it takes to do to prescribe a controlled substance like buprenorphine safely, then instead we're going to have to go to these self-pay only buprenorphine treatment programs that are under a great deal of scrutiny because that's the model of a pill mill. So we work with a number of the people who are trying to do things right and the DEA is exceptionally aggressive as uh, it relates to buprenorphine pill mills. And in fact, I will go so far as to say the DEA is deceptive. For those of you who know the Controlled Substances Act or, or Controlled Substance Prescribers, and I know there are some from last night, you know that uh, the DEA has the authority to go in for administrative inspections just to make sure that basically you're reporting uh, controlled substance dispensing or prescribing correctly as is required by the law, storing controlled substances properly if you have any on site. Well, they're saying they're going in, the DEA is saying it's going in uh, as part of this administrative inspection, but come to find out for purposes of accessing, the, accessing prescription monitoring program data, which is confidential state data related to the prescribing of controlled substances, DEA is saying they have an open investigation. That's a different legal standard. They're saying that they have what is effectively a criminal law investigation, which someone like me, an attorney's uh, uh, point of view, takes a whole different approach to knowing that there is an open investigation, and I'm sure a prescriber does too, 
You're not so willing to open your records uh, and files when you know that there's a, what is, you know, under the law, a criminal investigation versus just an administrative inspection. So uh, DEA is under uh, or is uh, applying a great deal of scrutiny to this particular uh, field. Again, it is largely due to the profiteering that is leading to the uh, appearance of buprenorphine treatment medications on the streets. And so we see that this is yet another example where the, the government is responding in a really aggressive way to what is the, the acts of a few bad actors. And in the case of my clients, they're lumping everybody in together as the same individuals. They don't know the difference between good and bad. And that's oftentimes common when we're dealing with enforcers, law enforcement, regulators, and especially legislators. Uh, in testing for substance use, there's uh, still a great deal of profiteering going on with self-referrals uh, and the corresponding overutilization, not individualizing care, not assessing the individual needs and looking at the various substances of abuse in the community, the trends, uh, as well as what the t types of methodology of urine drug testing are and when a preliminary test is adequate and doesn't need to be followed up with definitive and then when you should go direct to definitive because a preliminary is not reliable. Uh, at this point, few programs have those protocols. More should be putting them in just as a matter of best practice and again, not overutilizing services regardless of what your relationship with, is with the lab. You want to make sure that there's appropriate utilization just so that there's money to provide for your treatment. So that more providers, more insurers like Cigna are not pulling out of the market because of overutilization. That's something that's a threat to the industry as a whole, regardless of whether or not there's a self-referral uh, relationship. So uh, one of the recommendations that I will have is that you get protocols in place to ensure that you are not overutilizing any service, including urine drug testing. I had a unique opportunity to meet with insurers in Massachusetts back in October and was uh, fascinated in that day-long meeting to hear their perspectives and it was quite eye-opening because typically we work with the providers uh, in my firm and we're pushing back against the insurers as you might have been able to tell through some of my language. Um, but uh, the insurers were talking about in Massachusetts where there's a really great state parity law, it's a very liberal. Uh, state parity law that uh, mandates that insurers cover up to two weeks of inpatient detox and then post-detox rehab. There is now a new model of this treatment mill. It's basically a fast growth boom industry now that is arising in Massachusetts, again, according to the insurers. And who knows what the truth is? Maybe you all who are in or near Massachusetts uh, have better information, but they're seeing that this is effectively uh, the new treatment mill, like the pill mill, or like the liquid gold labs. They're seeing it as an area that is ripe for overutilization, waste, fraud, and abuse. And so we can be certain that they're going to be going back to the legislature, in addition to putting their own restrictions on to the extent that they can to uh, determine which program is acceptable and will we actually provide coverage for, and which program will we not? The parity law only uh, requires that there be coverage, but it doesn't necessarily uh, mean that it has to be for a particular type of program, depending on how it can be equated to a medical surgical benefit. And so if they're only providing what we heard about last night as a pathway program for other types of medical or medical benefits, then uh, they would be justified in doing that perhaps as it relates to addiction treatment as well. When you hear the word pathway, what that um, typically means in, in my opinion is that uh, it is heavily guidelines driven, one size fits all approach, doesn't respect the relationship between the provider and the patient, doesn't necessarily respect consumer choice in how his or her treatment is managed and costs are controlled, uh, and ultimately means that insurers are dictating care. Uh, and so only a step away from what we heard back in the Sarah Palin day, days uh, uh, with the death panels. Uh, so we've got to uh, deal with both extremes, right? We've got to deal with what is, according to the insurers, by their perception at least, this uh, exploitation of the state parity law and then what would be their extreme response, uh, eliminating the parity law at the legislative level, level or putting on you know, these extremely restricted, what did we hear about last night, uh, $1.50 a day for Medicaid plans, that same model 
uh, in the private insurance field. So with that inability to distinguish between the good and bad, and I do agree with the speaker last night that accreditation is just step one, how does uh, a consumer know, uh, how does an insurer know, how do we, other treatment programs and colleagues in the industry know who's good and who's bad, besides anecdote, right? Besides you know, perhaps you hear competitive pressure sort of stories, but is that just the competition or is that indeed something that is unfair business practice? Um, in light of the fact that the insurers are not able to distinguish between the good and bad, we can expect that they're going to deny or restrict addiction treatment coverage, like is similar to the denials of definitive testing where insurers have said on the uh, more advanced uh, mass spectrometry based uh, testing, we're not going to provide any coverage of these services. Uh, is it likely that they're going to do the same thing in addiction treatment as it relates perhaps to residential treatment? We're not going to provide any coverage of these services. Probably. Uh, Tennessee has an effort to limit buprenorphine coverage to two years under Medicaid. I think by now uh, it's been beat back, but you never know when these things are going to pop up. But are they going to you know, provide further limitations to what is a chronic relapsing brain disease? Uh, you know, the lifetime limits. Uh, are something that are somewhat unclear as we look to the continuum of care, not just for addiction treatment, but it's easier to apply in the field where there is still a great deal of stigma. And I have to say, I think we heard a lot about stigma last night, uh, where you know, certain people are unwilling to see addic addiction uh, patients, for example, the cardiologist who's not willing to see a person who has addiction. If that is the case, Wow, uh, we've got bigger problems than just the, the, the Tennessee um, legislature trying to restrict buprenorphine coverage for two years. It means that that structural stigma is going to be applied despite the fact that we have laws in place that are intended to undermine it. Uh, so we've got to be very uh, assertive in, in making sure that the law is applied appropriately and that we push back against these, short of, these sorts of um, knee-jerk responses to the lack of clarity or even the profiteering. So they can be expected to reduce, re, re, reduce the reimbursement rate for treatment services. Again, as we've seen in urine drug testing with CMS, as of January 1st, reducing the rates for testing for substance use under Medicare. And we can anticipate that uh, the private insurers are soon to follow that lead. Uh, you know, will that be the case as it relates to addiction treatment? The more the costs rise, the more that is likely. Uh, again, limiting the coverage to these low-cost outpatient clinical pathways, that model where MAT is restricted to 90 days. Uh, you know, I agree with the concept that we heard last night that there needs to be a continuum of care that provides treatment for anyone at any point, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there should be guidelines that need to be tried and followed when the definition of evidence base, as you look back to the initial definition, it wasn't just referring to literature. It was referring to literature and then applying a person's practical training and experience in a particular field. And that practical training and experience is especially important in the addiction treatment field. So you've got to resist the efforts to require that there be adherence, not just to these pathways or these guidelines, but to someone else's literature. Because we, as we know in a society where commercial interests are driving the lobbying related to you know, how uh, the Affordable Care Act is implemented, or even looking at MAT, whether buprenorphine's patient limit is going to be addressed in a certain way in light of the fact that you've got various providers of MAT in various settings, and you've got various uh, uh, the manufacturers of medications. Uh, some of them are telling the criminal justice system and judges to say, we don't want the opioid medications in our treatment programs, we only want the non-opioid ones. Well, this sort of commercial influence in uh, you know, pretty much everything that we do, why would you trust someone else's literature? Why would you allow someone to rely on someone else's literature? One of my recommendations is to get your own literature, make your own literature uh, by publishing your research. If you know of uh, the medication Abilify, which was the best-selling medication in the United States for years, that was approved based on six weeks of data, apparently. Right, so that medication approved for circulation in a healthcare setting across the United States through interstate commerce based on six weeks of study data. 
Why couldn't you do that for your addiction treatment model or for the addiction treatment model that many of you share and that you can unite and share costs through some sort of uh, leadership in the industry, a leader that would coordinate and just make this happen? Standard language is fine, but it's the principles that count, right? It's ultimately the, the outcomes, and when it comes to the payers, it, it is ultimately the costs that matter. The payers care about costs. So why not take your own six-week aggressive study and have it published in the literature within six months? Right? That's going to be necessary. It's also uh, likely, as I mentioned, that in response to what we see going on, the lack of clarity and the profiteering, there will be a, a, a efforts to amend the state parity laws in states like Massachusetts, not advance other parity laws in other states. The recoupment and civil litigation is, is occurring currently. Uh, with urine drug testing, and then criminal prosecution. That is possible in addiction treatment, uh, and it might actually be desirable in addiction treatment. If you're looking at the people who are deceiving consumers with their marketing practices, for example, those places where uh, they're saying that they're in one particular place, uh, and they've got a really great program on the internet that just has fake pictures, and they're actually in an office uh, park in the middle of you know, some parking lot, um, you know, that sort of consumer deception is uh, basically uh, prohibited under existing state consumer protection laws. It might make sense for, con for the attorneys general to go after some of those people because number one, you're going to get them out of the market. Number two, you're going to set an example for other people who are flooding the market without the experience or the commitment that you all have. Right? And then you're also going to rely on existing law instead of having more hyper-regulation as we heard about last night. I call me a libertarian, I actually think I'm libertarian light, but I think that as an industry, as any industry, the last thing that you want is hyper-regulation by the government. Right? So criminal prosecution could actually be used by an industry association in a way that is beneficial because it ultimately can use existing law and make sure that there is not an overt express need for new laws. So my recommendations for programs as you're thinking about how to engage with the insurers and how to deal with the, the new standard under the Affordable Care Act, uh, engage a medical director who is active and uh, incorporates medicine into your overall program of health care. And that would include pain, hepatitis C, HIV. And what we heard about last night you know, with this notion that a cardiologist is unwilling to see a person with addiction I would suggest you reject that notion. I would suggest you not focus on segregation of your patients from the community at large. Instead, help them get the care that they need from people who are uh, covered by their insurance and that uh, will provide them the overall health care with using your resources, as was suggested last night, to be the coordinator of comprehensive health care for this particular individual who has a substance use disorder, using your knowledge of this particular area of expertise so that you can coordinate that care. And what that means, again, as is distinct from what we heard last night, is that you would not be expected and should not be expected instead to convert your practice to a general practice where everyone in your uh, staff is able to do everything. Where else does that exist where you've got a staff of, of providers who are able to do everything. I mean, we heard about knee surgery last night. I don't mean to be, to be too hypercritical, but I want to focus on some key principles and distinguish some core concepts that the knee surgery that our speaker talked about last night was provided by someone who was a, a specialist and was not covered under insurance. And uh, the speaker was able to negotiate coverage for this great uh, outside specialist. Well, again, he was one of the haves, I suppose, but um, you don't necessarily want someone who's a generalist doing your knee surgery, and you don't want someone who's trying, again, this amateur, trying to coordinate care who has a complex condition that probably includes both pain and addiction. And so I think you should reject the notion that you need to operate in a place that has uh, every single service that would be necessary to provide treatment to someone who has a substance use disorder and reject the notion of segregation, that they also should be seeing specialists for their hepatitis C or their infectious disease, HIV, right? And that doesn't have to be under your roof, but it can be coordinated under your roof. <clears throat> Engage insurers, as we heard last night, uh, recommended to the extent that you can, if possible, and encourage the, that they look to you as someone who is doing things right and can help them reduce costs. Um, 
Good luck with that. Um, follow copay and pricing rules. This is an important one. You really do need to follow the copay and pricing rules. Number one, from a macro level, you need to operate in a system that works, but more importantly, you need to comply with the insurer's rules so that you can continue to uh, get payment from the insurers and not be expected then to pay back when they come after you for recruitment. Um, appeal or fight the unreasonable conduct. Uh, and this means helping your patients or even being advocates uh, or connecting your patients with advocates who can make sure that they get the coverage that they deserve. Uh, make sure the parity violations are at very least reported if not um, actually pushed back against. And the deceptive acts of, of insurers, as my firm is doing, is a firm that was uh, deceived uh, with a bait and switch on its formulary on December 15th to January 1st. We're taking that to the Attorney General. It's unacceptable. And you also do the same thing. There are consumer protection agencies, oftentimes, if not most times, the, the attorneys general, and you know, at least require the insurer to account for what it's done. I'd be interested in seeing you know, what language they point to in their particular contract uh, for justifying their bait and switch on our formulary, because then that's where we're going to take our proposed legislation to the DC Council. And you can do the exact same thing at the state level. We see it going on um, at, at, with the pharmaceutical industry, assisting patients get access to medications at the state level as well. Re report consumer exploitation, as I suggested, uh, to the attorney general and, uh, and prosecutors. This goes back to the point that you want existing laws enforced, and you want to get those people out of the market, and set a strong uh, 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 precedent that um, this sort of behavior is not acceptable in your industry. Cultivate patient advocates through your alumni networks. They'll be very valuable when it comes time for you to engage in policymaking. Monitor and be very active in state and federal policymaking. And then support your industry leadership so that you can share costs and that there can be, uh, again, this sort of uh, greater effort where you're uh, sharing resources and coordinating, as we heard last night, um, and ultimately seeing greater responses by working together. Two more true or falses. Consumers need a reliable way to identify addiction treatment programs that are committed to ethics and best practices. Anyone willing to stand up and defend that 1%, 2% position? <laughs> Fascinated. Was it you? Did you raise your hand? No. OK. And the next one. True or false? Sorry to give this one away. More government regulation of addiction treatment programs is necessary. And maybe even consider the term hyper-regulate. More government regulation of addiction treatment programs is necessary. This is the one that I'm most interested in. And this is what I want to be the discussion when we wrap up in just a few minutes. Uh, uh, you know, part of the discussion at least. This is great information. Uh, and this is something that your leadership is going to have to deal with. Uh, so um, I'm glad we have that. And I'm also a little bit um, sorry to the 50% of you who I've offended by saying we don't want to hyper, you know, have this hyper-regulated. I'm interested in your points of view. Generally speaking though, uh, I think that uh, self-regulation uh, is going to be much more effective and reliable because you all know how your industry works. A legislator who's a carpet salesman 90% uh, of the time and goes to session for 10% of his professional time isn't going to know how to regulate your industry. All right, so I do recommend that your industry unify in a little bit better way than it has in the past. Develop a code of ethics that would include what you're expected to do with respect to marketing claims and referrals. Because it's a really gray area, lack of clarity is uh, you know, the probably uh, least descriptive way to describe it because it's such a complex area. But how, you know, what, is, what is your voluntary code of ethics? Um, offer a signal consu to consumers and consider a patient protection fund. So right now there are opportunities for individuals or, or companies operating in the addiction treatment field to have membership. Right, so you've got a logo showing you're a member of a, a professional association or an industry organization. That's great because it shows that you're committed to collaboration, but it doesn't necessarily show that you're committed to ethics or any particular sort of standards. And again, we heard that your accreditation is you know, basic level first step as it relates to treatment programs. So uh, you might even consider a patient protection fund. 
This is something that uh, draws an idea from the legal field where we self-regulate and we have a client protection fund so that if the bad actors in our industry get sneak through the cracks and actually harm a consumer, uh, then that consumer would be able to get his or her money back and hopefully then be able to get the services he or she needs. Uh, and so if you think about a you know, voluntary association where you've got a sort of seal of approvals, you know, I voluntarily, voluntarily adopt this particular approach uh, to my business or my practice or uh, professional services. Uh, and by the way, you know, I'm supporting this fund that actually provides insurance that uh, if anything goes wrong with me or you know, my services or those that also share this icon of trust, um, that you will get your money back and you'll be made whole. Something to give thought to. Research and report on the cost effectiveness of treatment models in the literature. And this is again the example that I gave with respect to the medication Abilify, approved based on six weeks of data submitted to the FDA. If that can then become the biggest blockbuster drug in the United States for year after year, why can't you get six weeks of a really important uh, study uh, have it show the effectiveness of your particular treatment initiative or intervention and have that reported in the literature so it shows up in databases and then when ASAM or whoever else goes to the hill that they take that up there uh, and not just the one that they uh, had proposed that uh, be taken up there. So protect your own interest by showing that what you do works and it works in, in, in terms of improving patients health but also keeping costs low, which is a priority of the payers and the government. Educate and collaborate with insurers to the extent possible, and then uh, educate industry members and their staff, both on the best practices in the field as identified by your industry, and then also how to handle the concerns of waste, fraud, or abuse. And uh, I want to say to the executives in the room that um, as you think about perhaps engaging uh, counsel or a consultant to help you with some of the questions that you might have related to your protocols or just uh, making sure that you're compliant. I uh, have had some really, really great engagements with staff who have uh, called me just to make sure that what is happening in their program is okay. And from an ethical perspective, uh, I represent the business. I don't necessarily represent the CEO. I don't necessarily represent an employee in his or her individual capacity as an employee as a, you know, of the company. In fact, you know, expressly I do not, but I represent the company. And so I feel like it's okay for somebody calling with the company's best interest to say, hey, what do you think about this? Even if the CEO uh, might say it's okay. Uh, and I would encourage you as you talk to your employees to encourage them you know, first to come to you and ask or to try to educate or to, you know, to try to engage you to make a decision or share information that justifies your leadership decisions. But to the extent that they're concerned, uh, if you have trusted healthcare legal counsel, maybe allow them to uh, reach out to that in entity as well. Because I think it can work to your, uh, to the, your company's uh, benefit. And it has in cases where I've been able to go back and communicate directly about concerns and when we um, give thought to as executives who are, you put your lives on the line, your personal savings on the line, and you've got so much at stake, you also realize you've got great people working for you and that they put their livelihoods on the line also to work with you and not with somebody else, right? And then you also have patients who depend on you and alumni who have relied on you. And so to the extent that you're able uh, to uh, think bigger picture, and then ultimately come up with a reasonable solution that allows you to make a professional living and do well, uh, but provide the services in a way that uh, might make everyone feel comfortable, including legal counsel, uh, then I would encourage you perhaps to have a transparent discussion with your staff to let them know that you are confident in their judgment and they should speak with you first, but they would be um, you know, welcome to speak with your uh, counsel to the extent that you all have the interests of the business uh, as your primary concern. You might consider a plaintiff's fund that would be used to enforce parity provisions, consumer protection, uh, you know, some actual aggressive litigation and challenges to the laws. 
state policy engagement, um, you of course want to enforce the existing laws against the harmful conduct, as I already suggested, and then you want to support legislation that allows the assignment of benefits and ensures that checks are going to the treatment providers and not to the people in fragile recovery. Every state should allow that. Regardless of what the contract says, the law should ensure that it uh, effectively uh, does not allow a contract to take effect. Uh, any provision in a contract that um, is inconsistent with that portion of the law should be void. Um, parity, right? You want to make sure that you can show legislators how parity is being applied at the state level to uh, efficiently use resources and reduce costs and improve care. Uh, so they can expand in the states that it needs to expand and then I can remain strong in the states like Massachusetts despite the fact that there is apparent or, or purported exploitation. And then any opportunity that you get to analyze a bill and advance patient provider decision making and consumer choice uh, and you know, in my opinion not the government insurer pathways that limits you to a particular approach that must be applied in a one size fits all manner I would encourage you to strongly consider that legislation as it relates to your medium and long-term interests as an industry and as a program. And at the federal level, I think you should first thing Monday morning, if not as, you know, as soon as you uh, can get back to your computer, uh, I guess today is Monday, so as soon as you finish up, um, send a quick email through whatever web interface you, can ha you have to uh, your members of Congress to encourage them to approve CARA. There's a lot of talk about it. Uh, and I think it is likely, and I know that they would feel much more supported to hearing from you about CARA, and it does make a difference. Uh, and then also engage on the buprenorphine patient limit. If the rules come out and you think that they can be done better, provide feedback to the federal government. And that, again, uh, can be done through your industry, also done by your program. So we, uh, we have made significant progress. For those of you who were here last year, I spoke at the end of the AXIS last year, and uh, I am amazed by how different the presentation is this year, uh, not just because of what's happened in the industry and because of these trends, but because of the progress that we have seen in the past year. Uh, as an example, um, C4 Recovery Solutions, which is one of the primary uh, organizers of this Access Summit, uh, has voluntarily implemented sponsor and exhibitor requirements that include reference to the patient's best interests, uh, voluntary compliance with the applicable laws uh, of the vendor that's coming to the uh, program participating, no un medically unnecessary services. So everybody who is on your program or you see in the exhibit hall has voluntarily acknowledge that this is the standard for this particular conference. I see that as great progress. And they're also engaging uh, throughout the year to continue the progress of the Access Summit in educational webinars that hopefully will continue to uh, keep people active and uh, to the extent that there can be even greater leadership within your field, uh, hopefully that uh, there would be uh, ongoing support and engagement throughout the course of the year and the webinars can be a good check-in point. So this is where I want to drop a bomb uh, and discuss the 2016 elections briefly. Uh, because everything that we've discussed today is new as of the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, especially as it applies with the combination of the Affordable Care Act with the Equity Act um, through ACA regulations that extended the provisions of parity to more of the plans that are covered by the Affordable Care Act. That's why we're seeing more coverage that's why we're seeing more utilization, some of the lack of clarity, some of the profiteering, right? It, there is this transformation that has occurred in your field, and it is largely due to the Affordable Care Act. Well, there's not a Republican candidate, and I say this, again, who's more libertarian light and typically side with conservatives uh, in politics, and I'm in desperate search of a presidential candidate, um, but from your industry's standpoint, Republicans, you need to know, would repeal the Affordable Care Act. Even John Kasich, who expanded Medicaid coverage under the Affordable Care Act in Ohio, has said he would repeal it. So that means the return of pre-existing conditions. So people who have substance use disorders, HIV, hepatitis C, cancer, they wouldn't get coverage. Those people would be uninsured because we don't have a clear plan from the Republicans to replace the Affordable Care Act. There really has not been a viable plan set forth. In fact, someone tried to press Ted Cruz about this in Iowa just last week, and he avoided the question. And the guy said to the reporter, 
I can't support him because he hasn't said what he would do besides repeal it. Uh, so that means the elimination of the essential health benefits and mental health and substance use uh, disorder treatment services are essential health benefits for which coverage is required under the ACA plans. No application of the Equity Act under the regulations, which means a loss of parity in these plans that otherwise weren't the few that were governed by the original Equity Act. Uh, and without a clear plan to replace it, what I could envision is there would be a period of uh, chaos where Republicans scramble to figure out what they're going to do, uh, and states are left uh, holding the ball and are not able to be responsive, and with some of the new uh, state governors taking an action to repeal uh, the expansion of Medicaid in their states, they're not going to be particularly uh, uh, willing to try to make a smooth transition. I think you could expect that in some of the states it would be a pretty abrupt transition away from the Affordable Care Act. So it could be chaos not just for your industry, but for consumers of health care at large. So you need to bear that in mind as you search for your presidential candidates. The Iowa caucus is today which means most of the craziness should be finished as of today. Uh, this is the most undemocratic of our processes in the entire United States, by my assessment, uh, this caucus uh, that they have in Iowa. And so then we'll move to uh, more of the uh, primaries where there's a direct uh, vote uh, of the individuals who are affiliated either with a party or able to vote across the board among all the candidates, uh, as is the case in my state. But the real clear politics poll averages, as of yesterday, show Cruz over Clinton, Rubio over Clinton, Clinton over Trump. And we know that Clinton had a bad week last week with her emails, uh, where there's a report from the State Department that the emails that uh, were on her home server were more than classified, more than even highly classified. Uh, I don't imagine that that's going to uh, go away anytime soon. And she had already had a bad couple of weeks. So what does that mean for the Democratic side? Are there any strong candidates to fill a void? Probably too late for Joe Biden. Uh, so what's going to happen? Uh, most of the people who observe U.S. politics say that the U.S. Senate majority will likely go with the outcome of the presidential election, meaning that if the Republican takes a White House, then it's likely that that Republican is going to have both the House and the Senate to be sure to repeal the Affordable Care Act. So. Uh, in addition to engagement uh, through your programs and engagement through your industry leaders, you also need to be very engaged in this presidential election and then ultimately in November when you vote for your legislators in addition to a president. So I'd be happy to move into questions now. Again, I appreciate your attention and the opportunity to present. I apologize for anybody uh, for whom I was a little bit too aggressive in my points of view, but as an attorney, I'm an advocate, and I'm trying to advocate for your industry's interests. Yes. Sounds like your practice is seeing a lot of the same things that mine is, where you've got programs that are either sending in people to, to, to loot patients uh, and bring them back to their other programs where they can be treated better, or uh, you've got um, patients who are actually getting some sort of incentive from the program in order to draw people away from their prior uh, programs. Uh, so that's the example that I have. That sounds to me like a clinical question, uh, besides trying to eliminate uh, from... So, like, like, that's my point, is that you can have everyone to be the best provider in order to make uh, I'm not saying that, but conceptually, I, I think I've addressed that you want to have some sort of way that the patients who are uh, eager to get well can distinguish the good programs from, uh, from the bad so that they're not... Uh, distracted by that sort of activity on the uh, patient side or the provider side. And then I think also you want to try to isolate the providers that are allowing that to happen or that are facilitating that. Uh, and then you might consider from a legal perspective, um, uh, healthcare fraud statute if there's insurance in, uh, in involved. Uh, and you might also just uh, think from a creative uh, state law perspective how you might be able to make a case as an advocate under existing state laws, uh, perhaps um, with, with the application of um, you know, uh, some of the, the, uh, the state anti-kickback laws or the, the state uh, um, 
equivalent of a uh, healthcare fraud statute and make a strong argument to your attorney general or make a strong argument to a prosecutor, but it's going to require legal creativity uh, on the part of the attorney advisors while the, the industry itself has to respond by trying to um, uh, showcase and highlight who the people are who won't be a part of that and then isolate those who are. Brian. Um, my uh, very eye-opening engagement with insurers recently um, taught me that they don't really pay attention to something according to one insurer until they see it's about uh, $250 million on their bottom line for that particular year. Uh, so to the extent that this is, you know, in Florida at least, where Cigna's pulling out of the market citing the costs, I think that for those who've remained in the uh, market, that uh, your Florida Association or whatever group of leaders who have uh, attempted to organize voluntarily in the industry approach them and say, let's work this out and come up with a solution that uh, works for us all. Um, and otherwise, I'd be interested in other people's ideas. Yes. I, I understand that there is abuse of the system, but there, you know, we do deal with a chronic relapsing brain disease. And I've had, I have a patient that um, I brought her into treatment four times before it finally took. And I still, she just sent me an email. She's in Italy um, with Princeton University on a, um, um, an overseas you know, uh, study program. And her family sends me a Christmas card every year. Well, that's what should be your motivator and not you know. the fear. And you know, that should be what compels you to get back in. But the question is, can you show your own value at a time when 129 people are dying per day and you kept this woman alive through four treatment uh, attempts and on the fourth was successful, uh, whether she got hepatitis C or HIV in the meantime, or you know, whether other sorts of value to the healthcare system occurred through those treatment, if you're confident that you can show that value, then you know, I think that it's possible for you all to identify what your outcomes are and attach costs to those and show what your value is. I actually went to New Jersey and met with Magellan, and I took them data, and I showed them how their repeated admissions into the short-term, you know, the, the front end of treatment, detox, rehab, were the most expensive, and, and having those frequent admissions, if, if they would just pay us to fully treat a, a patient, here's the outcomes of when we're allowed to do that. This is how you're going to actually reduce your costs overall and they listened to us and then blue cross in new jersey dropped magellan and took on value options so we kind of got you know you know we, but we made headway with them so it does work but when we took that data and we actually went out into the industry and tried to find people that we could do comparative studies with our data nobody had any data and i hear so much about evidence-based treatment out there why and I call it evidence-based treatment with no evidence. Why don't you use the table process throughout Access to try to find five people who would do it with you? I mean, that's well, why you're definitely here. Definitely will. I mean, that's what I'm here for. If, if, there's, if they really want to clean up this industry, I'm all for it. Good. Sounds like you're back in. Yeah. Meet Jim at the round table <laughs> after Barclow. the break. <laughs> you were talking about interventionists who work with treatment programs, and it's a sort of a two-part question, but under one sort of ethical guideline. What if an interventionist doesn't believe in maintenance therapy, medication-assisted therapy, and refers only to drug-free treatment? They're the only person working with that individual and that family to determine where that person should go. Is there an ethical issue or concern there? And then what is your opinion on these insurance consolidators? They're people who take individuals who haven't purchased a plan, work with them, get them insured, pay for their insurance, and then refer them to a treatment program, charging the treatment program for those services. So on the question of the uh, interventionist who uh, has a, a certain mindset of only referring to certain programs, ultimately the programs that employ and compensate that uh, sort of professional, I think are gonna find that they are um, out of step with mainstream standards for treatment and they're going to have a really hard time justifying 
to insurers that they are capable of tr providing the medical type management that we heard about last night that I said doesn't need to be uh, segregated but can be coordinated, right? So an inability to provide those services uh, by an unwillingness to consider that they need to be incorporated into a person's overall treatment plan, I think is gonna ultimately result in a market response where they're excluded. Uh, as it relates to the, the new model of a professional who's helping people get uh, treatment by finding them, helping them enroll under a special life scenario under the Affordable Care Act, uh, how is that different from a navigator? How is that different from someone who's out being paid by HHS to do the same thing. That's one of the ethical questions, but uh, to the extent then that there's the payment of the insurance, there is uh, um, the effectively the create, you know, creating a market for someone that uh, increases healthcare costs, that's an unsustainable model. And ultimately, there's going to be some sort of response, you know, market-based response again to the unsustainability, whether that means that the program that is doing that uh, is too expensive and doesn't ultimately uh, um, make adequate profit or it provides poor treatment quality as a result because it can't afford to meet the standards of adequate care as we've heard about last night and discussed today. I think that um, there will be a market response but it would be helpful in the meantime because it's not going to be fast um, that industry try to uh, implement some sort of way to make it clear that the programs that do that don't get our seal of approval and then educate consumers on the value of your seal. Yes. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Dee. Dee, go ahead. If, there's one, if you were right there, sorry. Thank you. Um, Coletta Dorado, I want to comment on the slide where it was 50-50 about government regulation and, and those that felt we didn't need it. I come from 25 years in the financial securities market, and yes, I started when I was five years old. <laughs> Having said that, um, we proved that self-regulation does not work, i.e. the Bernie Madoffs, the Sanfords, that were able to do what they did. And their families and their members of their staff were on the same committees that were quote unquote regulating or doing the compliance for our industry. It wasn't until all the regulatory bodies got together and formed FINRA, and obviously we had the blow up that we did, but that cohesiveness in that regulation has helped in also having one standard body. What concerns me here is that I'm hearing a lot of associations forming and creating different pathways possibly, that I feel that as an organization and in, in this area really has to come together and starts with a really strong medical director and a really strong clinical director but also establishing standard that everyone follows, and then the insurance companies will pay attention because the benchmark will be set. But I am concerned that if regulation isn't put in place, then the government is really going to step in as well as the insurance companies. So I really encourage everyone to really get involved so you're and make saying, the right decisions. Yeah propose something that would be satisfactory to the good guys in the industry or, you know, because I, I do see that as different uh, from just waiting for government to regulate. Uh, but on, on the point of the financial regulation, that's very helpful for perspective. Uh, but I think we're talking about something different with healthcare. Because uh, in healthcare, there is an assumption that you're putting the patient's interests first. And that's not necessarily ever assumed in a financial uh, setting, at least as far as I'm aware as a consumer and not having advised anyone in that particular sector. So um, to the extent that you know, people are saying that uh, addiction treatment providers are healthcare providers, then I think that there is an additional duty of care that ultimately goes with that assumption. My name is Bob Coates. I'm the executive director of the American Academy of Professionals Health Programs. We link state um, professional health programs for law as well as for medicine for physicians. We are, are, are trying to match treatment centers up with the very high standards that state medical boards, licensure boards have for the treatment of uh, impaired physicians and the like. We have a situation, though, that is confounding us. As to 42 CFR, we're finding in uh, one specific jurisdiction 
that a, uh, a Chancery Court judge put an injunction on reporting 42 CFR with very, very clear violations. The question being, does a state court have the ability to put injunctive relief on a bad actor who has violated 42 CFR so that the proponent of uh, patient uh, protected health information can be protected? Um, don't uh, fully understand the factual scenario, and of course I don't provide legal advice from a stage, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, I know that uh, 42 CFR Part 2 typically is not deemed to have a private right of action uh, and that it applies um, by its express terms to federally regulated addiction treatment entities. Uh, so the question is whether or not it even applies to whatever entity is um, claiming that it cannot share information. And then to the extent that a state judge tries to enforce uh, that uh, provision of federal regulation, uh, you know, I, I'm sure there is some sort of basis in state law under which someone uh, could try to do that. Um, but it would be more so the state law as a matter of policy adopting the federal re regulation that might not even apply. Well, the question being is if the uh, licensed professional who was reporting uh, to the government, and it is truly a, a government action here in terms of treatment, um, uh, if, if that licensed professional runs a risk as either a treatment facility or as the individual license of, of not reporting 42 CFR. What do you mean reporting 42 uh, Well, CFR? Uh, making a claim to the appropriate authorities that a violation has occurred under 42 CFR. Okay, yeah, the, the question is whether or not a violation has occurred, and I didn't hear any facts that suggested it had. Yeah, I just, uh, uh, Gary Fisher, I just have uh, kind of one comment and then I have one question. And, um, and just because uh, you're in D.C. and I, I think you're back there with our policymakers, and the comment I had is, is sometimes I, uh, I run an abstinence-based treatment center, uh, but we believe we do medication-assisted therapy. We don't do op opioid replacement therapy. And so I, I think I get painted with this brush that I'm some you know, Cro-Magnon, you know, back in the dark ages kind of guy because we do give, you know, whether it's an SSRI or whether it's a, a blood pressure medication, I mean, we do a lot of assistance with medication. So it would be, the, my comment is, is it would be great to be able to change that, uh, that conversation to, you know, the, as far as medication assisted therapy just being uh, opioid replacement therapy, but that's, that's a comment. My question is, to the, um, when you were talking about the assignment of benefits. And so in our, you know, we, we've had this situation where up to a very tragic result where the insurance company sent uh, the insurance payment to the client. Of course, somebody early in recovery, you know, gets several thousand dollars and you're right, it didn't go well. And um, so my point is, is how can, or my question is, is how having this contract that obviously, how can the insurance company kind of supersede this contract I have with the individual? Uh, it goes to the agreement between the insurance company and the individual, which prohibits that practice of uh, assigning the benefit directly to the out-of-network provider. Okay. Couple other questions, but I will say that um, to Jim's point, for those of you looking to network specifically with someone or to find somebody that's doing some similar things to you, we've got a big bulletin board outside that has uh, a bunch of note cards. So if you're looking to meet up with somebody, put a notice up there and say, I'll meet you at lunch or, or let's have a table for the recovery residences or let's get together, any of that. We're here to facilitate any of that kind of meeting and networking that Mike's talking about. Anything that C4 can do to support that, please let us know and we can send out an e-blast or if you want to call something, we're, we're happy to do that. But here's another question. I'm Johnny Allen with Equality Recovery in Washington, D.C. Thank you, Michael. You're extending the call that we've heard before for a credible bargaining coalition. Uh, and we all, I think, recognize the need for that. I'd like you to comment pro and con on the important, whether it's uh, ideal for us to include the whole behavioral health field in that bargaining coalition or stay within the addiction field and co-occurring field precisely. 
Well, to the extent that we heard from the other commenter that there is a lot of splintering within the industry, I would think the broader a coalition of people who voluntarily accept uh, these standards of um, honesty would be much better in terms of uh, educating and engaging consumers and then ensuring that that is adopted in the consumer's mind as the seal for what is acceptable in the behavioral health field. Broader's better. Hi, my name is uh, Jack Friedman. I'm with uh, Sanctuary Recovery Centers in Delray Beach. And I, I wanted to talk about two of the things that uh, we saw here today. The first is the idea of a coalition, which um, I'll be the cranky old man in the room for a minute. I, uh, well, always actually. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I tried to put together a coalition in 1991 based on resisting the move toward or addressing the need toward uh, managed care, which was fairly new at that time. And we had uh, facilities uh, from all over the country fly in and we had a meeting and we had an agenda and we had a goal and it immediately disintegrated into who would be in charge, whose name would be on top things of that nature, which has been my experience outside of conference ballrooms uh, in this industry. And I'm asking you a lot. It's an impossible question. I don't know how to address that. Yeah, I, I think that uh, that might be a problem with uh, some of the organizations that are out there that are just not meeting the needs of the field. You know, there's a heavy power play. Um, so I certainly understand what you're saying, but uh, I also see that you've got uh, you know, an organization that is uh, naturally with C4 in what it's doing through these conferences four times a year and now webinars and uh, keeping people engaged and taking some of the steps that uh, we saw on the slide with respect to advancing industry practices with additional resources they might be able to do more. And I'm not saying that it's a lot of money, but you've got uh, what is appearing to be a natural leader that's doing more for these particular issues than anyone that is formalized and that does have a title and a very prominent board. So uh, I would go with what is naturally occurring and just try to keep and actually improve momentum. Okay, and this, thank you. The second thing I, I just wanted to make mention of is the, uh, the almost perfect 50-50 for and against government regulation. And and I make this point from personal experience, that's a really good indication. We don't know what to do. Uh, I was in 2007 a government client, if you will, for the Department of Justice in a uh, suit they brought against the local municipality of our beloved Boca Raton, which passed a local ordinance that would effectively eliminate treatment from the city. Um, so in that case, I was against the uh, regulation by government, but the government came in and made that, at least mollified that to some degree, so in which case I was for government regulation. Right. So I'm not really sure what the rational response to that situation uh, is uh, going it's, forward. It's as our colleague suggested that our government regulation would be great, right? <laughs> But someone else is, you know, a carpet salesman in whatever state, his version of regulation of this industry is not going to be great. So there might be that middle ground approach where you can, uh, you know, whatever you see as your, your mutual ethical standards could also be applied to a new ethical code that's under the law that is, is similar for healthcare professionals that are otherwise identified under that law. So, you know, maybe just add addiction treatment professionals or providers under an existing law. There's a, a lot of uh, opportunities to think creatively about how to do it and make incremental progress. And I think the issue that you discussed about, you know, what you've seen in the past has been because you maybe want to do something really big, you know, all at once. But um, the incremental approach, I think, is going to be the way that you're actually going to make progress. Hi, I'm uh, Raleigh Oden. I'm a uh, medication-assisted treatment prescriber. Um, in, you were talking about the limitations on coverage, duration of treatment, like with buprenorphine. In December, I think it was, CMS sent out a letter to all Medicaid contractors regarding hepatitis C treatment, which of course we all know is incredibly expensive, that clarified that uh, Medicaid drug programs need to pay for any drug that's FDA approved. And since there's no uh, 
time limit on FDA approval of buprenorphine. How does that CMS letter affect things like Tennessee trying to put a two-year limit? It's very effective. Uh, so we put together a letter for a client that was in Tennessee that cited that and other legal analyses about how that was very, very illegal, their approach to uh, limit the prescribing of buprenorphine. And it seems to have been effective, but who knows what's going to pop up next in that state.